Well, good morning, everyone. It's 9 o'clock, according to my phone, so we're going to get started. I like to get started on time for these. So those of you who are still getting breakfast and finding a seat, there are a couple empty spots up here in the front. And uh, we are looking forward to a great seminar this morning. So, and welcome to those who are also, who are on Zoom. I'm Sandy Vandenberg. I'm the Director of Plan Giving here at Torrance Memorial. And uh, we always love to see a great audience here. I know we're gonna, you're gonna hear some great information today. And uh, it's especially great to be back in person. It's been almost a year now. We've, we've been back in person again with the Zoom option. So we actually can reach a wider audience uh, with, this, with this setup. So I wanna thank Mitchell Yee. He's uh, back in the booth there controlling the, the Zoom program and uh, appreciate his help. We also do record this because it is on Zoom. And uh, so we're able to, um, be able to post it on our website after afterwards so for those if you really enjoy what you hear you'll be able to share that link with them when i send it to all of you afterwards they'll be able to listen to it too this series is called taking care of your financial health and it's brought to you by um, the the foundation office but also our professional advisory council they're a group of volunteer estate planning attorneys, financial planners, CPAs, professional fiduciaries, life care managers, things that are related to planning for, uh, you know, for your estate and for your end of life. And we really appreciate their support as they help to educate on charitable and tax uh, planning and estate planning. Um, it's, uh, it's so important to give attention to these things. So if you have a cell phone, if you would please put it in silent mode so it doesn't interrupt our presentation. The restrooms are through the door in the back corner over there in case you will need those. And you should have all received a door prize ticket as you came in. We'll make sure everybody has one before we do the drawing. But one of our uh, professional advisory council members, Maureen Dearden, has generously donated the support to give these uh, to give these, these door prizes every time. You should have also received some handouts um, of the PowerPoint today and um, uh, some additional things from Chris Cordova, one of our presenters. I do want to apologize. Some of those handouts are a little bit, um, have some black marks on them and uh, the quality of that isn't, isn't what we like, but I had challenges yesterday at four o'clock in the afternoon when I'm making all the copies the course, that, that's when the copy machine has to run out of toner, right? So thankfully our IT people were, were Johnny on the spot, they came, but then they replaced it and then the quality was a mess. So it was worse than what you're seeing. So he had to put a new part in the copy machine. So anyway, the work on that machine will continue on Monday. But thankfully I was able to, to get enough for today. You also have a flyer for next month's uh, program and an evaluation form, which we appreciate your feedback. Um, and that's the evaluation form is also a good way to share your contact information. If you're not getting emails or whatever, make a note on there and I'll, I'll make sure that gets set up. We like to hold all the questions till the end. So if you have, um, you'll see there are some index cards on the table. So if a question comes to you during the presentation, please write it down. We'll collect those at the end. And Chris and uh, Nancy will help uh, take care of that. For those of you on Zoom, we have the uh, at, at the bottom of your screen, kind of in the middle, is a chat box, and that's where you can submit your question, and we'll do our best to be able to address that as well. I'm always curious. I, we get a lot of repeat attenders here. I'm curious how many of you are attending this seminar for the first time. You raise your hands. Oh, that's fabulous. Look at that. That's quite a number. Well, thank you for discovering us and for coming. We do like to do a lot of education for the community. We do a health a focus lecture once a month. It's usually on the third Wednesday. It's called Miracle of Living. And the next one for that coming up is on March 20 at 630. It's here in this room also with a Zoom option. The title is Got Allergies? Learn How to Nip Them in the Bud. That's the topic for this month. Um, and then our Medicare 101 uh, series is also very helpful. There are some postcards like this in the, on the back table in case you wanna pick that up. It's all on Zoom now at 6.30. The next one is on March 27. And uh, very informative if you need to learn about Medicare. It's very informative and I think you'll appreciate it. 
That's, that's provided by our Torrance Memorial IPA. So many of you are aware that we're currently in a, in a process of expanding our emergency department. How many people have had personally an, an emergency department experience? Okay, there are a number of you out there. How about how many of you have accompanied somebody to the emergency department? So you all are familiar with that. And if that was at the Torrance Memorial Emergency Department, you probably saw how busy we are. So we're seeing over 100,000 patients a year in a space that was really designed to see about 60,000 patients a year. So it is in uh, desperate need of expanding. So we're going to a second floor and uh, we, there aren't a lot of two-story emergency departments around the, the country. So our team traveled and they, they visited some and they've really done their, a lot of due diligence to make this be the best kind of plan it can be. One of the things that will be required for that is to install new elevators. So we have to have some elevators off the lobby in order to get people to the second floor. So some renovation is going to start in October of our current emergency department lobby. So if you look at this, this is what it's going to look like when it's done. Okay, here's the door where you enter. And for um, starting in October, as they build this out, they're going to put a temporary triage area over here so they can build this new triage area. So when we're finished, you'll come in the door and you'll go down here to check in instead of straight ahead. And we'll have four triage areas there in the back. So it'll be a, a bigger space to, you know, when people first come and they need to figure out what, what to happen. And then once this is open, over here is where the new elevators will be. So we'll get, we'll use this as a temporary triage space while they build this. Once they move in there, then this will get built out to have those new elevators put in. So that starts in October. And in October also, we're gonna start demolishing the second floor space where we're expanding to. It used to be the ICU before we moved into the Lundquist Tower in 2014. So it's built out as a, a space with, um, with all the, the rooms and stuff. So, and again, for those who are coming in just now, there are some seats up here in the front if you wanna have a, ta a seat at, the, at a table. So I mentioned the due diligence. We, we'd really like to put a lot of thought into how we build out these spaces. So I'm gonna show you a video. It's, it's by, and it starts a little bit loud, so be prepared for that when I do the next click. But Connie Center is our director of construction. And what they did over in one of the, our, our warehouse buildings, we, set, we built a, a mock-up of what that triage area will look like. So that is, um, and so this video is, is about that. So um, there's somebody looking for a seat, I guess she's finding it. So see what Connie has to say. Welcome to Torrance Memorial Medical Center. Today, we're here to show you how far we've come in the last year with design of the Emergency Department Expansion Project. We've come far enough to build full-scale mock-ups of several of the spaces planned. A couple of patient rooms along with the triage area planned for a future first floor renovation. We undertake this with great enthusiasm to the extent that we build paper cutouts, we bring in furniture, and we build templates of the headwall, for example, what their headwalls look like today, and we get their input as to how they would like their headwalls to look tomorrow, where all the med gases will be, where their nurse call buttons will be, and other important jacks and plugs. We use this as a discovery opportunity. And what I mean by that is when you plan something on paper, it doesn't always come to fruition in the field. We had a whiteboard planned for a particular location, and lo and behold, found out that it's just not going to work in that particular location. So what do we do? We go back to the drawing board and we reevaluate our plans, make adjustments, and make improvements. 
We had nearly 200 people participate over the week-long period that we had these mock-ups open for evaluation. They filled out detailed surveys, and they even put up post-it notes in locations, providing us with some critical insight and information to consider. So we compiled all the information, and we know there are going to be some great takeaways for us to implement as part of this project. You know, we've spent some good and valuable time evaluating our design. We take this process very seriously at Torrance Memorial because we know how much it contributes to the end result. Well, we invite you to stay tuned for more updates on this very important and exciting emergency department expansion project here at Torrance Memorial Medical Center. Connie Center is great in front of the camera. She did those kind of updates all the way through the process of building the Lundquist Tower, and it's so interesting to be able to see what's going on, and it's so important for our staff to be able to have input on what's going to make this space work the best for them as they um, provide care for patients. So uh, it's just fun to be able to uh, share that. So. For, there are a couple seats up here in the first two rows if anybody in the back wants to come and sit at a table. There are some spaces up here. So I mentioned I'm director of plan giving. I always like to highlight some of the, the types of plan gifts that you can do in your estate planning. Um, the most common is the bequest, which is listed first here, where you would include in your, uh, in your estate plan to leave a, a gift to Torrance Memorial to help support the great work that's going on here. It's so important to have a, a good hospital in your community. And our tagline is exceptional care, exceptionally close. So we really uh, appreciate the support. We are a nonprofit hospital and your, the community support is real critical to what we're doing. So this is a list of some of the different things. Some of them are income generating. And I always like to highlight one of them today because you're gonna hear about IRAs and, and RMDs and all of that kind of stuff. I just wanted to make a few comments about um, your beneficiary designations for your IRAs and your 401ks. It's so important those are clearly noted on, uh, in the documents and that you revisit them on a regular basis. And uh, please do not name your trust for that. The IRAs and 401ks are outside your trust. It's really complicated for those who are left behind if when to uh, get to claim those funds when it's left to the trust. So it's always best to name an individual or a charity. You can use percentages to divide that up. And if you are philanthropic already, this is a great way to continue that after you're gone. We don't have to, charity who receives these beneficiary, um, the remaining funds, we don't have to pay taxes on it. So it comes at a, as a pure donation. If you leave it to your heirs, they're gonna be taking those RMDs, they're gonna have to take that money out and pay taxes on it. So really think about that, how you might best utilize that to continue the, the charitable giving you're already doing. So <clears throat> I wanna just share, I'm helping an 84 year old friend with some, uh, an estate she inherited from a man she's known for many years and <clears throat> <clears throat> they were not married, so she's a non-spouse uh, beneficiary, but he named his trust on all of these IRAs, and he had like seven or eight different banks where he had various accounts, and it has not been easy to, we had to set up special accounts, and in the name of his trust for her benefit, and it has really um, been challenging, whereas if it had just been given to her, it would have been a lot easier. And a shout out to Tom Schlepatha, who's here, he is um, one of our certified financial planners, and he is working with this friend of mine, and uh, his office has been tremendously helpful. So um, if you're looking for a financial planner, you can consider Tom, along with the two who are presenting today. So um, anybody who um, includes us in their estate plan does get uh, welcome to our Heritage Society. What? It's a group that is of people who have included us and we have a, once a year, we have an appreciation lunch and uh, we include you on a list in our, our magazines and so forth. So it's, um, that is, is one of the benefits. So if you have done that, please let me know so that we can include you on our list. 
We have a great website with information about plan giving. It's listed right here. There's this, this wonderful personal estate planning kit you can download from there. And if you have difficulty downloading it, just email me. I'm happy to uh, send it to you. Um, I, have, I have it in a PDF that I can send to you, but it's a great document where you can put together everything in your estate all in one place. There's a place to list family members and pets and accounts and property and all that kind of stuff. So my phone number and contact information is there. So reach out with any questions. As I mentioned, we are a nonprofit hospital and we do appreciate your donations. This slide just gives you an idea of different ways you can help support the hospital. And now let's get to the, um, the presentation for today. So I'm going to introduce, we have co-chairs for our professional advisory council. One of them is Karen Pryor. And uh, the other is Betty Bergman, who's with us today. So Betty Ty Bergman is an estate planning attorney with Peninsula Law here in Torrance. She's going to introduce our greeters and our presenters, and we'll keep on going. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you, Sandy. Good morning, everybody. And, Hope everyone's doing well. We always love uh, bringing these kind of presentations to the community. And as Sandy said, um, I am an attorney, so I'm going to start out with a little disclaimer about our programs. Um, the material that you're going to see today is for general information only and is not intended to provide spe specific advice or recommendations for any in individuals. So to determine what is appropriate for you, you really should consult. A, a professional and have some uh, direct consultations from a professional. So that's our disclaimer for the morning. So uh, aside from that, I do want to introduce some other uh, members of our professional advisory council who are here this morning. We have Suzanne and everybody come step to the front so everyone can see who you are. Suzanne Grudnitsky, she is a licensed private professional fiduciary with Conserva Trust Fiduciary Services here in Redondo Beach. That's Suzanne. And then we have Carol Cabbage. And with PDM yeah. CPAs here in Florence. Yeah. And we have Tom Schlepatha, who is a CFP, Certified yeah. Financial yeah. Planner. And he's with Morgan Stanley here in Torrance. And we also have Grace Sinclair, and she is an independent estate planning attorney with offices here in uh, Redondo Beach. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. All right, so now we're gonna move on to the presentation that you're here for this morning. Today's presentation is going to be called IRA and 401k RMD planning to protect your retirement assets. So I'm going to introduce the speakers who are going to be, pre be presenting here this morning. First, we have Christian Cordova, and he is a CFP. Chris Cordova is a certified financial planner specializing yeah, in retirement planning, 401k and IRA preservation strategies. Chris has been providing financial services since 1989. And in 1997, he started his independent private practice California Retirement Advisors, located in El Segundo. A frequent speaker and contributor to news articles and magazines, Chris, he also conducts retirement planning courses throughout the South Bay. When he isn't working, he enjoys playing beach volleyball and volunteering to support Bike MS and Torrance Memorial. <laughs> okay, and then we also have Nancy Gregg, Nancy Gregg is a founder and CEO of Advanced Planning Solutions, Inc. in Redondo Beach and a registered principal with Satera Advisor Networks, LLC. Nancy has been involved in the financial services industry since 1978 and takes a behavioral financial approach with her clients to instill confidence in their financial future. Nancy has made this a family business with her son, John, working with her in the firm. She's a longtime resident of Palos Verdes, and her husband and she and her husband enjoy traveling, playing pickleball and golf, but most of all, spending time with her, their four, uh, four children and grandchildren. 
Okay, so let's welcome the speakers and they're gonna begin. Hi everybody, can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, excellent, now Nancy will be presenting first and I'll be back later, but I wanted to start off, we thought it was nice to start off just a little bit more about why we believe this topic is so important today. Uh, so I'm gonna start in sharing some numbers. Now you all know this, but the national debt is now $34 trillion. That's trillion with a T, right? And we think of that like a credit card, a government credit card uh, to a degree. Now the interest alone to service that debt uh, is 12 is expected to grow 12 trillion dollars in the next 10 years. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, and by the way, that doesn't even include Medicare, Social Security, uh, the aging population. It's just the interest on the debt to service that debt. And uh, keeping that in mind, I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you at this time own a tax deferred retirement account of any kind, an IRA, a 401k, a inherited IRA? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. It's most of the room. Uh, and the reason it makes sense is because there's an approximately $36 trillion in retirement accounts that haven't been uh, taxed yet around the country. Uh, and remember, the, the government debt, 34 trillion, retirement accounts, $36 trillion. Ladies and gentlemen, the statement I'm gonna share with you now might be the most important statement you hear today. If you don't remember anything else, please jot this down. It's very simple. Your IRA is an IOU to the IRS. I'll say that again. Your IRA is an IOU to the IRS. So keep that in mind because the US tax system simply doesn't have enough, enough tax revenue to generate the levels of obligations that they've promised. And your IRA is the low hanging fruit waiting to be taxed. So what we've done, uh, so what you've all done so far is a great job getting uh, to retirement, saving if you're already retired. Uh, it's not an easy task to do to climb that mountain and get to that point. Getting to the summit of retirement is an uphill battle by itself. And if those of you are already retired, congratulations to you. Those that aren't, um, maybe you will be very soon. But it's not just getting to the summit that's important. It's also getting back down that's also very important to be able to do so safely. And it's a little bit like climbing Mount Everest. But did you know that more people have died descending? Got the wrong slide there. Have more people have died descending Mount Everest than actually reaching the, tum the summit on the way up? So it's a little bit like your financial life. It's not just getting to the summit that's important. It's making certain that you can have a successful retirement. And a large part of that is making sure that you have an understanding of the distribution strategy that you put in place along the way. How you take money out is very important. So today, you're gonna know specific elements of how to protect your retirement and potentially save money on taxes. You'll have handouts for your future reference that you could utilize for yourself or with your financial practitioners, whoever that may be. Hopefully you'll have a better understanding of how to take money out, the whole point of why we started with this statement. Uh, choices affecting your income and tax savings during your lifetime, but also potentially affecting your beneficiaries after you've passed away. You could also be the beneficiary as a recipient of receiving some of these dollars. And really a bit of an introduction to the specialty area of financial planning. I say specialty area because if you think of it, when we go needing this type of help, we don't go to a retirement distribution specialist. We don't recognize that as a profession. We go to a CPA, tax advisor, investment advisor, financial advisor. So the onus is really on you to make certain that the people you're working with really understand the odd nuances pertaining to these rules that are so important upon you taking the dollars out. And so here you see the agenda. Um, Nancy's gonna take it over from here. You have these in the handouts uh, and we'll get to the program. Thank you. Uh -oh. I took my clicker. Uh, okay, everybody can hear me okay? Good morning. All right, so uh, Chris just did that. There's me. All right, so let's talk about some of the foundation of taking money out when you get ready to, after a lifetime of building your retirement, 
we now have the option of different choices upon the distribution. So when you look over at the, this side right here, you see that market returns and policies that the government puts in place, taxation, things like that, we have very little control over. But when you look over here, wherever that went, you do see you have control over other portions of that. You have control over the asset allocation of your investments and retirement plans. We'll compare, put those together. You have control over how much you're spending. So it's so interesting when clients come in, not everybody, certainly not everybody in this room, but a big part of your homework going home is in retirement, how much money do you need a month? It's surprising how many people don't really know that because they're used to living on a paycheck. But how much of that do you need to pay your bills? So that's always your homework when you go home. And then we, you have some control down here at the bottom. You know, so, uh, about how long you live, how long we as your financial advisors have to help you make that money last because it needs to last your whole life. And if you have legacy plans and charitable plans, we need to help you solve that as well. This is a, a theoretical spending profile. Uh, generally, when we look at someone's retirement plan, we look at distributions coming out, how much money you need. And very often, uh, assuming you retire at 65, again, just uh, guess that you're, uh, the first 10 years, you probably spend more. Maybe you're traveling, you're going to see grandkids, you're doing a little bit more of that. And so you have a, uh, probably filling up most of that spend bucket. But as you age, maybe you don't travel quite as much, there's usually a little bit of extra money there, possibly. Uh, if inflation hasn't taken it all away, but we help you solve for that as well. So at the end of your life, the big thing we want to help you fill in that gap is have you solve for that health care gap. Long-term care needs now, as people are living well into their 90s often and more, typically need that to be solved easier to do it when you're younger. Sometimes you can self-insure and self-fund that, but maybe you can't. So there's options for that as well. So my favorite nerdy part of my job is cash flow charts. I actually really like these. I need to understand where the money's going and where it's coming from. It might be a little bit hard to see, but you can see in this first column here, that that is your living expenses. It's what you've told us it takes you to spend every month, or year, pardon me. And we have uh, added inflation factors. So you can see that it increases. But did you forget about taxes? So if you say we need $146,000 every year, we actually need 236,000 because you can't forget about the tax portion of that. And depending on how your portfolio is made up, is it an IRA, is it after tax money like an investment account, the tax structure is different. So this is a typical method we use. We call it in my office, the bucket method. And we use it for uh, gathering assets, but also at retirement as well. So the short-term goals, many of you know this, you always need that liquid money. How much is depending on you? Three to six months is an average financial planning amount so that you're not dipping into your investments just because you need to have new tires on your cars or you need to make sure that your job is secure. So you always have to have those emergency reserves. Then you have medium and long-term goals, five to 10 years, 
maybe you're planning on buying a home or a second home, sending kids to college, and then the long-term goals, because ultimately what we want to help you forget about are the fluctuations in the market. Market's always going to go up, market will sometimes go down, and it's all about the average. So if you can rest easy at home, even when the market has one of its pullbacks, then you won't worry about it because that is a long-term goal, not affecting your cash flow now. And that's the same in retirement. So in retirement, all we do is make one or two years, depending again on who you are and your philosophy and comfort level with your statement that you open every day. Do you need one year or two years of very safe money? So that, because ultimately your retirement assets, even in retirement, have to grow. If you're pulling out 4%, you need to at least earn 4 possibly 5% to, and more if you can, to help the account stay level so you're not just pulling out a dollar for dollar distribution. All right, <clears throat> so we've got different buckets of money. At the top you can see, and they're all taxed differently, a health savings account. Health savings accounts, if you have excess money, everybody know what a health savings account is? So, yes, so you have, a, you can use it for unreimbursed medical expenses. But if you haven't used that in your lifetime, at retirement, you can actually use it at like an IRA. So you do pay income taxes on it when you withdraw, but you can use it as part of your retirement income. A Roth 401k and an IRA have already been taxed. So that bucket, when you take distributions, there's no tax on it. Taxable account, you've already paid income tax on, but any growth in it or dividends, you will pay those taxes on them depending on what the tax rate is, much lower than ordinary income. Now at the bottom is your 401k or IRA, never been taxed, and it's what Chris said, is the government wants that money. You have to pay that money eventually, which is what an RMD is. We love acronyms in our business, required minimum distribution. And those rules are, Chris is gonna go over that a lot, those rules have just changed. So now the RMD starts at 73. But let's backtrack back a little bit to the taxable account. So all of those things that are happening inside your already taxed account, we'll call it a investment account or your savings account or your trust account, if you have dividends, those affect how your social security is taxed because it's all added together as income. Your qualified dividends, the same thing, and your capital gains. So when you sell a stock, call it a stock, and you have an unrealized gain, that the minute you sell it, it becomes a realized gain and it's taxed on the capital gains basis, lower than ordinary income, which is good. So let's look at these buckets. This is, we often see this. So the red bucket is your taxable accounts, maybe your IRAs. That is when you retire and you start pulling money out of there, it's taxed as ordinary income. And if you go all the way over to the other side, the little green basket, we often see too little in that bucket. What we'd love to see is a balance between the two. So if you're a person who retires with just IRA money, haven't really saved much in your investment account, you will actually have to have a bigger pot of money than someone who has both. Why is that? Because every 
dollar that comes out of your IRA, which maybe was a 401k at one time, is taxed as ordinary income. But guess what? That's what our job is, to, is to help you. There's little tools that you can do to maybe change that ratio. So what's your thought about going forward? Think taxes are going to be higher or lower? Oh, I figured you'd say that. <laughs> so they're historically, believe it or not, not bad right now. Look at the graph from years past. So if you believe that, there are things you can do, Roth conversions, things like that, to try to fill up that little green basket on the other end. Is that right for you? I don't know. Uh, everybody's different, and you, it ha you have to look at it to see if it makes sense. Uh, so there was a, something at the side, but that's fine. So this is your typical uh, federal tax bracket, 2024. So, uh, you know, we are, uh, this is all bracketed, so you have to do the whole thing. The first, uh, if you're married, 23,000 is taxed at 10%, and then you just keep adding it up. So you can see that maybe someone in the 24% tax bracket, see that one here? That might be your taxes there. That's your income level, and then your tax, your income level based on this scale is <clears throat> 4%. So where do withdrawals from retirement accounts come from? They are all taxed on this table, not capital gains, which is much lower, but ordinary income. When you take a withdrawal, so consider your uh, retirement checkbook, if you will, as a bucket. Money that comes in, maybe it's uh, different types of income, are all added up, and that is your income that you're taxed on. And it depends on which bracket you're in that shows how much you owe. Every single dollar is subject to income tax pulling it out of an IRA. So let's take a look at Martin and Jen. This is their balance sheet. Uh, you can see over here, Jen has a stock account. So we'll call that her savings or her investment account. She, it's, she saved it after she, uh, from her income. But now let's look at her these here, everything in yellow are her retirement accounts. They belong to her in her name. Martin has a Roth and a TSA. That's his right here in his name. So why isn't the Roth highlighted in yellow? Can you guess? Yes, very good. So we've highlighted all of the yellow here, roughly $2.1 million, because I added it up. And if you add all of their assets together, it's about $6.3 million. They've done a great job saving during their lifetime. But what ha why is this, why are we highlighting that? Because you have to take about a 40% haircut because all of that is taxed. So your really, your net worth is this minus the tax. So you could call it a 5.479 estate. Do you follow me there? Because taxes, you can't forget that they're due. Uh, we've, we've kind of beat this one to death. Basically, uh, taxes are always due, even at death. Investment gains on uh, anything inside an IRA, we'll call a 401k just an IRA, 
but there's no favorable capital gains taxes. It's all taxed at ordinary income, always. There is no step up in basis. So this is actually really important. So it determines then which bucket you're going to use first. If you have legacy children, charitable organizations you want to use, it, uh, any kind of an IRA does not re receive a step up in basis. Can't be transferred to a trust during your lifetime. That's uh, obvious. So what are some general types of tax advantage retirement plans? You've all heard of that. Traditional IRA and an inherited IRA, a Roth IRA and an inherited Roth IRA. Those are all individual plans with your name on it that you own. What are these other names? These are company names where the company has uh, sponsored these plans, 401k, 403b, 457, TSP, that's a thrift plan. Simple SEP and other company plans are typically used for smaller companies on the simple SEP is usually a self-employed plan. They have higher levels of uh, contribution than an IRA. Roth has not been added to the 401k several years ago. So now when you have a 401k plan, you usually have the option of investing in the traditional side or the Roth side. But just last year, they finally allowed Roth to be in your simple and your SEP plans. It wasn't really an option before that. But what happens when you retire or move companies? You have a choice. You can leave your assets in your existing 401k plan. You can roll your 401k plan into your new company, assuming you got a new job. Take it with you. We actually prefer that over leaving in there because sometimes we'll work with clients and they have different buckets of money. And over the years, they forget that they're there. So we like to keep track of everything you have. You can roll over your 401k into your IRA. That is not a taxable event. So when people use the word rollover, it means it goes from one tax deferred 401k into an IRA, no tax. Or you can take a lump sum distribution that is taxed. You can convert your plan to a Roth. There's rules, but you can convert your plan assets to a Roth or make an in-plan Roth conversion. I kind of mentioned that before. All right, let's talk about QCDs, Qualified Charitable Distribution. This is where you're uh, charitably minded and you want to give a charity of your choice, maybe Torrance Memorial, for example. You take it from your IRA, direct transfer to the charitable organization. Some of the rules are donor must be 70 and a half. Annual income was 100,000, our annual cap, excuse me, was 100,000. It's 103,000 now. Can only transfer from IRAs not a 401k, an IRA, and a transfer prioritizes deferred taxable income first. No uh, tax deduction on transfers, but it removes the RMD, the income, from your AGI, adjusted gross income. So let's look at one of those. Albert and Shirley, age 74. Combined IRA value, 500,000. They're in a 24% tax bracket. They want to give $10,000 to charity. They have $15,000 of itemized deductions and a $32,200 standard deduction. So what that means is their standard deductions higher than the itemized, so they're going to take that. So in this case, 
they took $10,000 of their R&D, required minimum distribution, and deposited it into their checking account. They gifted that $10,000 to charity, Torrance Memorial, for example. $10,000 was reported as what? Their taxable income. Why? Because they've never paid taxes on it. Now, see this next line? That's actually a mistake on the slide. So on your papers there, you might want to cross that out. It does satisfy your RMD. The tax bill at 24% on $10,000 is $2,400. The total cost of your charitable contribution is $12,400. All right. So let's look at a different way. <clears throat> the charity, Torrance Memorial, gets the $10,000 directly. What did I take out? I didn't, you didn't send it to your <clears throat> checking account. It went directly to the charity. What happens when you do that it becomes a qualified charitable deduction, satisfies your RMD, guess what? $10,000 then is excluded from <laughs> your taxable income. Guess what the tax bill is? Zero. So the total cost of your charitable contribution is $10,000. So all you did was change the way you distribute the money and you save $2,400. Okay, I set the stage for Chris and now he's going to come up and go through some other options with you. So thank you very much. Hi again, everybody. Doesn't Nancy have the most Comforting, soothing voice. <laughs> I feel so relaxed. Okay, so yes, so Nancy did set the foundation giving you ideas as far as which retirement accounts make up which tax baskets and different ways to roll over the accounts, the six ways, plus the charitable option as a potential seventh way, and a number of different elements in terms of cash flow and distribution considerations. We're going to Keep rolling from there, and I'm going to start just by sharing with you a little bit about a scenario in terms of what do you do now? Because although you may be very charitably inclined, you probably can't afford to give it all away. And you might want to spend some of the money for yourself to live your ideal dreams and retirement and everything that you want to do, right? So although we don't have time to walk you through a complete a case study on what this might look like, I'm gonna walk you through some of the most important considerations I think people might ponder <laughs> as they're making these distribution options. The first is, we're gonna take a second look at the different types of tax baskets that we have here. Oh, sure. And you can see, we'll start at the bottom with the red basket, that we're gonna consider those as after-tax dollars, dollars that have already been taxed, but now, as long as you leave them in there, will continue to be taxed for the rest of your life, the rest of your retirement, be it interest. And that could be the same, whether it be real estate, you have the rental income, sell that, capital gains. So taxable uh, while you own it. Separately from that, we're gonna go to the top IRA accounts like Nancy stated, and those are the tax deferred dollars that have not yet been taxed. Uh, tax infested types of retirement accounts that still need to be paid to the IRS, forever tax, if you will. And then finally, the green baskets, which we're going to consider the tax free uh, baskets. Uh, these are the never tax baskets, because no matter what the growth comes to there, you won't pay the tax on the way out. Now, the first thing I'll notice is that this is not always a typical household. It's getting better because in this case, you're, we're starting to see some more tax-free Roth buckets, but this is not the norm for the most part. And the very first thing you might consider doing is taking beyond just the investments, because there's way more to the health of your retirement wealth than just the investments. And although you may have a very good asset allocation strategy, 
it's very important to start considering what is your tax allocation? What percentage of assets do you have in each of these baskets? Do you even have the green baskets at all? And the reason this is important is because financial freedom is all about choice. And if you don't have the makeup of these different tax baskets, you don't have the freedom and flexibility to pick and choose which baskets to take the dollars out of in particular years when you're looking at a cash flow projection to see when you're going to need the money and play your tax system, play the tax brackets to work in your favor. Does that make sense? Okay. So a, a conventional wisdom on how to take dollars out to continue with this thought here is that a lot of people would just say, I need to keep my taxes down, so I'm going to start taking dollars out of the red basket because I don't want to pay any taxes this year. You might even have gotten this advice from a financial professional. It's not uncommon because a lot of people think in today to win the, to, just to win the, the battle, but not to win the war. <clears throat> I encourage you to start thinking a little bit differently and start thinking about not just lowering your tax rate for today, for this year, but more importantly, to lower your lifetime tax bill. And what I mean by that, it, that isn't just the lifetime tax bill over your life, but that's important. If you're married, it's very important to start considering what will happen after you pass away as part of that lifetime tax bill. And if you care, and this isn't everybody, but if you care about your beneficiaries, then maybe even start considering what the ultimate tax impact will be to them as well. The lifetime tax bill. Does that make sense? Okay, very important because we, and it's partially our fault as consumers because as taxpayers, we tend to judge the tax preparers based upon what our tax impact is for this particular year or last year as we're prepping for 2023 now. And if we have to pay a lot of taxes, we are not happy with that. And I'm not wanting you to celebrate paying higher taxes, but I am wanting you to start thinking about not just the taxes that you're going to pay today, but sometimes paying a little bit more today can help you pay a lot less in the future. Okay. So whoop. as we go forward, then an ideal strategy, and I'm not going to say it's necessarily just a smart strategy. I'm going to say it's ideal because we can't always get to this point. Ideal strategy is when at the latter part of your retirement now you have mostly tax free money to work with. But it doesn't always make sense to put everything in tax free because there are there is an argument for still keeping some dollars in tax deferred to maximize the lower brackets. Uh, uh, and take advantage of the, the standard deduction appropriately so that isn't wasted whole point is start thinking about how to get dollars into tax free. Now, one of the ways to do that is to consider converting dollars into a Roth IRA. I remember when this was a novel idea, but now most people, thank goodness, at least know about this as a particular strategy. Now, mind you, this is not a silver bullet. You still have to cross the bridge of tax land to move dollars from the forever tax IRA or tax deferred retirement accounts to the never tax, tax-free retirement accounts, the, the green baskets. Um, and there's a lot of considerations. You see some of them here. One is to consider what you believe about future tax rates. And if nothing else, one of the things you should take away from today as well is that right now, the current tax system, the way we know it today, with the current tax, tax jobs and cuts act, tax cuts and jobs act is scheduled, scheduled to expire at the end of 2025. How many of you know this? Okay, good. That's really important because at the end of the year, if our government of that year, if the government doesn't come to a decision at that point in time, what will happen is the current tax laws will sunset. And that means that everything reverts back to the 2017 rules, the 2017 rates. And if you've ever compared the 2017 rates to the, to the current tax rates, it's a big difference, not just in the tax rates on the numbers, but also as consumers, we are unhappy with inflation, but as taxpayers, we actually should celebrate it a little bit because every year, the amount you can push through each tax basket basket is indexed for inflation, and you can push a lot more through even some of the lower brackets today than you could have in 2017. So proactive start uh, tax planning in the next couple of years is critical. At best, maybe they extend the bracket, the system, uh, but the only logical thing that makes sense is for them to do is increase it, which is going to be hard to 
you know, agree upon. So it's very possible that it does sunset as well and then reverts back to 2017. That doesn't mean that you still can't do planning after that time, but it's important to know the opportunities you have in, in mind at that time or the possibilities over the next couple of years. What will it cost you? This is really important too because a lot of times what we've experienced is when you go to your tax preparers, you ask uh, their idea about converting to a Roth IRA. And tax advisors, accountants, are very important people to have on your team. So I mean no disrespect, but they've sort of been trained to feel, and partially because the judgment we impose on them and how much we're paying this year, is essentially to don't pay taxes until you have to. You guys know this phrase, defer, 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 and you retire at a lower tax bracket. Sound familiar? But that isn't necessarily the case anymore, and especially with the government debt staring down our throats and, and the possible tax increases. So it's really important as a smart consumer, like any particular product that you might buy, is to understand the costs. So at least please ask them, well, I need a figure. What will it cost me? And what is potentially an optimal amount that I might convert in order to at least take advantage of some of the lower tax brackets that I might be able to be in. Now you can make a good decision. Um, can, you, can you deduct, can you reduce that cost? And this is where sometimes you see these marketing um, from coming your way on social media or wherever you're getting them to uh, you know, convert without any, any taxes. It's not that there aren't any taxes, but there's sometimes ways that you can offset the taxes in order to make it work better for you. But there's no silver bullet here. It's individual for each one of you based upon your own set of resources, your cash flow, and what sort of whether you're working or not. So there's so many variables to consider there. Um, you see uh, many of the rest of them. The one I'm going to jump to here is just going to be how much might be an optimal amount to manage for RMDs. And what I mean by that, it would be great if at least the amount of money that you're spending is consistent with what you're taking out of the accounts. But oftentimes, just because of you've done such a great job saving in retirement accounts, that you end up with significantly more money in retirement accounts causing distributions. Sorry, I misspoke on that. You end up having more distributions than you need to live off. And that just simply means that you're paying more taxes than you need in every single year. Getting ahead of that is helpful if you start this process ideally before you force to start taking required distributions which is why it's important no matter what age you are especially in the planning window of age 59 and a half to age 73 it's really important to start thinking how you can take control like nancy said some of the items you could take control of is when you pay the tax and sometimes paying the taxes at the lower rates even though it may not seem as much is very important to consider for the future now, in terms of Roth IRAs, and there's so much more to consider with Roth, with Roth conversions, but this is not a Roth conversion session, but um, just there, there's just one thing to keep in mind is that there certainly are not required minimum distributions during your lifetime, which has a bunch of possible benefits with it, uh, including uh, some of which could be very helpful, not just for you during your lifetime, but also to your surviving spouse after you pass away. Uh, for example, because there's no tax on the dollars and no required, sorry, because there's no required distribution on the dollars, those dollars can sit for a rainy day and potentially be used in the future without having to worry about what the tax rate system is going to be at that point in time. How many of you would like to go to an ATM and click, you want to take out $100 and then wonder how much you're going to get back after you get that, uh, the, the cash out, right? That's what happens with future tax rates. We don't know what the rates are gonna be down the line, but with Roth IRAs, you have no required distributions and you decide when to take those out. It also allows your accounts to grow uninterrupted tax-free over your lifetime, which is great for the future, and potentially pass the dollars on to your surviving spouse or to the kids tax-free as well. We often like to say this is the ultimate gift of love because the kids may not pay the tax, uh, but you have to, Think about that for yourself. Maybe some of your kids are in higher tax uh, brackets than you are, and maybe some are not. Uh, and it's a factor that should be thought of individually for each of you. What if you don't want to convert to a Roth IRA? Well, you don't have to. A lot of people don't by default, but at least make it a decision. Don't just not do it because you have never looked at the cost associated with it and understand what the value might be 
um, to get it done. Uh, but ultimately, there are some benefits still, at least, of having the compounding of the tax deferred growth over periods of time. We, it's known as the eighth wonder of the world. You've got the interest on the principal, the interest on the interest, and then the interest on the money that would otherwise gone to pay for taxes. It's a big benefit, which is how you accumulated so much money. But it's great for accumulation, poor for distributions when you need it most. And that's why it's important to start thinking about that. Still, it keeps things simple. But unfortunately, it doesn't solve the problem. And the problem is that there comes a day of reckoning. And that day of reckoning is typically now been bumped up to when you turn age 73. And that's when you're forced to take out these required minimum distributions as of the current rules. Uh, and bumping up again to age 75 if you were born in 1960 or later. But please, I can't state this enough, and this may not be for you only, but if you have adult children as well, to start letting them know. Because what we hear every time somebody turns age 73 and comes see us, we talk about the rules and the choices and look at the cash flow and realize that they have the tsunami of RMDs way more than they actually need to live off, that they have no choice but to take the dollars out, except for unless you're doing a QCD with that, which is why it's such a valid strategy to possibly reduce your, your taxable income, is that start thinking about this before you get to 73 so you don't have your back up against the wall with limited choices. Um, another thing that's changed with the new sets of rules is that the missed RMD penalty, which was the steepest penalty in the tax code, has now gone to age, uh, is now gone from 50% to 25% and then reduced down to 10% with timely reporting. Now, think about that for a second, because I do. Every time somebody gives you a benefit, I'm going to want to know why. Does anybody find that odd? You're getting a deal from the government here? And the reality is that even though it was the steepest code and the steepest penalty in the code, it wasn't something that they imposed most of the time. If you had reported that you missed it, had a good argument and excuse for it, they would often not penalize you. But remember how we started. The government needs money. They don't have enough tax revenue. So it's my belief that we're gonna to start to see these imposed more often and that's the nature, that's the reason for the reduction. All the more reason for you to start thinking to make sure that you're doing these things properly. Uh, there's also, this is new also as of this year, is there's no lifetime RMDs on plan Roth accounts. These are 401k Roth accounts, for instance, which might sound odd to you if, um, uh, if you didn't have an understanding of the old rules. If you had a plan Roth IRA, um, there was still going to be an RMD unlike a Roth IRA that did not have an RMD. So this, if you have this sitting in an old plan, just know that that's uh, one of the changes that's taken place for this year. Okay, so this RBD, like Nancy said on the acronyms, this is a really big deal, we like these, but the most important thing I want you to remember is that it's a really big deal. And differentiated from the RMD, it's the required beginning date. And this is the first date original owner account is or was required to begin taking these rmds now oftentimes um, people don't realize that it's not just by age but it is actually april 1st of the year following the year that you turned 73 at this point or in other situations uh, i'll discuss in a moment so think about that if you're turning age 73 this year your actual required beginning date wouldn't be until april 1st of next year. That doesn't mean that you don't have to take out a distribution for this year because you still have to. And if you do not, you could punt it and push it forward to next year. But next year, you have to take a distribution for this year and for next year. Sometimes that can be strategic depending on what your retirement income looks like, sometimes what your um, what, what your vacation pay is going to be when you're getting that cashed out. And there could be unique times when to do that, but that's normally the case. But you'll see a little bit later where the required beginning date doesn't just apply to you necessarily, but it could be something that you need to know about for somebody who's passed away when you're inheriting the dollars. And that's why it's gonna be a really big deal. The other alternative to this is if you have, if you're still working, if you're still working, uh, you get a still working exception, which allows you to take the dollars out at a later date. In other words, you're not forced to take out a required minimum distribution if you're still working, 
providing that you're not more than a 5% owner of that firm. So if you have your own company, that wouldn't necessarily work, although there is a loophole for that at times. Okay, so now that you understand the required beginning date, we're gonna take a look at how this works. Now I can tell that nobody here is here, nobody in the room is here yet, but at some point you're all gonna turn 73, hopefully, and live a long, nice life. And when that happens, you have to go back to your statements and look at December 31st as of the prior year, and then simply use the table. And I provided these to you in the handouts. There's a uniform distribution table on the front, and there's a single yeah. life table on the back. Notice what? that there are two different tables. This will be very important. Also, we're oh, handing yeah. this to you, and those of you at home watching on the Zoom, you have the handouts as well oh, in a PDF. But it's important that if you have an old one to throw it out because this table changed as of last year actually as of 2022 when the rates changed. now these don't change all the time it's been about 10 years since they changed it but the reason it's important is because the factors the divisors per age has changed so just make sure you're using this right one and then what you do is you take the divisor based upon your age uh, at the end of the year, and then you divide it by the balance as of December 31st of the prior year. In this example, uh, at age 73, it would be 26.5, and uh, the dollar amount here would be 18,868, as you see. Does that all make sense? Okay, pretty straightforward. The one thing that I'll note in terms of the um, uniform table that I've loved uh, has been a little bit of an adjustment. In addition to the divisor on your table, you right next to it now also have the percentage withdrawal. And that's important to know because a lot of times when we ask people what their cash flow looks like, what is their income, everybody always cites if they have required distributions, they cite that as income. That isn't accurately correct. And the reason why is because it's taxable as ordinary income but it isn't necessarily income just because you're withdrawing money from your account. You have to start considering whether or not you're generating the cash flow within your accounts to cover these withdrawal percentages that you're going to need. And there's different ways to go about generating cash flow. You can get cash flow from dividends, from interest, even from capital gains. The point is that these percentage withdrawals have to come out regardless of whether you have investments that are generating cash flow or not which gives you another criteria as to consideration as to the types of investments that you're making differently when you're retired, taking distributions versus when you were working and accumulating your assets. Okay, and here's the uniform distribution table, so you have that. Um, there is an exception here, and that's gonna be when an IRA owner is married and is more than 10 years older. And this is the only table that we didn't hand out, and the reason why is it's pages long. And so if this happens to be in your situation, like my mom and dad are 11 years apart, they go to this table, which is different um, than the regular table. So just know that that's there. Now, don't get any ideas if you're married. It's not worth getting a divorce just to go to a younger table, a younger spouse, and use this table. So it's not worth it. What you're thinking. Okay, a few of many important RMD considerations then is do you take them early in the year or late in the year? Good point, right? I mean, a lot of people maybe don't think about it until maybe they need it. Now, uh, again, conventional wisdom is if you have an interest earning account that maybe you wait till the end of the year to get that interest. At the end of the year, you get a little bit more compounding over the course of the year. However, if you have money in growth stocks, for instance, there's no guarantee that that value is gonna be there at the end of the year. And if you have a good up year like we did last year, followed by a good first quarter like we have so far this year, you could be up 6% right now this year alone and automatically just cover all of your distributions at 4 or 5% from a 6% increase that you've already had this year. I always remember Peter Lynch said, you never lose money by taking a profit. And this is where that would come into play. So there's an argument for both sides, depending on what you believe, but at least take some time to consider that. Uh, one of the things to factor into that is whether you have automatic recurring distributions, because if you take a withdrawal at the start of the year, because you're trying to take advantage of a profit of a harvesting some gains, but you forgot that you also have automatic distributions coming out at the end of the year, it's very possible that you have two distributions coming out in the same year, and, and that may not be what you want. Uh, also, the timing of when that automatic distribution might be monthly or it could be earlier or late in the year. 
Are you making a QCD in the same year as an RMD? This is important because we want you to make the RMDs, especially the QCDs, especially if it's going to Torrance Memorial. But what we also want to make sure is that you're getting your uh, QCD that's offset against your RMD so you're not paying more taxes than you need to. And the first distribution that comes out of every account is considered your, your RMD. So if you took the RMD first and then later on you wanted to make a QCD, and let's say it was $10,000 of a RMD that you needed, but you took a $10,000 distribution, that now has been taken out like the first example that Nancy gave you and now has hit your bank account and it cannot be utilized for a QCD. You could still do a QCD and you won't pay any more tax for the year than you otherwise would have, but you won't be able to offset the, the RMD against that amount. So make sure you consider that. Are you selling specific investments or proportionally across your, your retirement accounts? Also really important because it, it, you have the ability to pick and choose where your dollars are coming from. And oftentimes we see people, especially if they're handling their own investments sometimes, just to keep things simple, might use, let's say, a moderate allocation for all of their retirement dollars, maybe a 60-40 allocation, very common. And the problem with that is you have a year, first of all, like you had a couple of years ago, where even the the, the stocks and the bonds were down in value, and even a 60-40 allocation was down 16 to 18 percent, depending on which companies you might have been using. But let's just assume they're not. Let's just say that stocks did well and bonds didn't, or a particular type of stock did well and a particular stock didn't, and it's all in that mix. When you're selling out of that fund or ETF, you're essentially selling proportionally across the board, selling the winners and the losers. And we want to buy low and sell high, not sell low. So it doesn't give you the ability to do that. So take that into consideration because you have the ability to cherry pick which investments have done better when you're selling. Also, which types of investments do you own to help provide the distribution rate necessary to fund those RMDs? This comes back to the percentage withdrawal that I stated earlier that is very important to consider how much you need to take. Because maybe you can generate a 4% dividend off some of the equities that are out there, still get some growth over long term, but, but withdraw most of your distributions from actual cash flow. I don't know if you've looked at, we always seem to have short term memories, but if we take a look right now, we're pretty happy because the markets are up in value real, real, really nicely, right? But if we look back just at the end of 2021 or all calendar year 2022 and then to 2023 with the S&P 500, it goes like this. Literally, it's a V. So it only just recently met the break even point and surpassed that. But that means that anybody that was taking required distributions over that two year period, if you didn't have any sort of a cash flow set aside, either with a bucket plan philosophy like Nancy stated, set aside in cash from previous gains, um, or from cash flow that was actually paying in order to generate the RMDs that you've needed, that means that you were essentially selling at losses over a two year period just to generate the taxable income to add insult to injury, pay taxes on essentially dollars you're selling at losses. Very important, significant difference between investing for accumulation and distribution. Does that make sense? Okay. And then from which accounts do you take the RMDs? Another nice thing is that you also, not only do you have the ability to cherry pick amongst individual positions, you could also cherry pick amongst different accounts if they are certain types of accounts. And so it's important to understand that certain types of, IR, uh, of retirement accounts, you can cherry pick, like all of your IRA accounts, if you have five accounts that are down in value, but you have one that is up 50%, remember, uh, in, a lot of times we, we, we make these decisions emotionally and we might say, oh, I'm going to sell those that are down because they're down in value. What you really, by the way, want to evaluate is why you own those in the first place. If it's part of a solid investment strategy, investments go in ebbs and flows right so you might have a year like this year value investing isn't doing as well as growth investing but the blend is your friend the combination of investments often work well together in the long term to reduce the volatility over the long run but 
if you just have something that maybe you shouldn't have owned in the first place because it was something a buddy of yours told you about and it's just been a dog for years, doesn't fit anywhere in your portfolio, that might make a, a good sense to maybe get rid of that position. But otherwise, um, generally, it makes good sense to sell from the gains, buy low, sell high. And in that case, you would have the ability to cherry pick the account, the IRA account that's up in value and not sell from the other accounts that are an important part of your portfolio while they're down in value. Now, you see a little picture on the left there to the left of the pictures, and uh, that just sig signifies that you have this other chart, which is the RMD aggregation chart that tells you that there's different types of accounts you can aggregate. If you have, for instance, four IRA accounts and you have um, one 401k account, you can't take all of your distributions out of that one 401k account. In fact, if you do, you will pay a penalty on all of the IRA accounts because you have to take at least two distributions in that scenario. You can aggregate all of your IRA accounts, but you still have to take at least one distribution from the, from the 401k account. And that's what this chart will help you identify. You can, if, you have a, if you're a teacher, you have 403bs, you can aggregate uh, and pick which of those 403Bs the dollars come from, but also different than a 401k and an IRA. If you have each of those three, you would need at least three distributions. Does that make sense? Okay. And then the other that uh, a lot of times now people are getting mixed up is if you have an inherited IRA for any reason, you cannot uh, aggregate uh, the RMDs from an inherited IRA and a regular IRA. Those need to be separate as well. In fact, if you have two inherited IRAs and they're from two different decedents, you also cannot aggregate those two inherited IRAs. If they are from the same decedent, however, you can aggregate and pick and choose those. So rules and aggregation, that's why you have a chart to refer back to, but just know that it can be strategic because when you take money out, impacts how to preserve your dollars depending on what you're selling. You have choices, use them. So what about after the IRA owner dies? This is now important. Um, hopefully uh, it's nobody in this room that's already passed because uh, otherwise I'm seeing dead people and that's not good. Um, but if, uh, or it means I'm there myself. Um, but the other reality is that you could be receiving an inherited IRA as well, or you're planning for your beneficiaries to make sure that they are doing things properly. So this is also a big change that has taken place. And you may have heard a little bit about this already, but let me just set the stage on this for you first, because for many, many years, what we were able to do is if somebody, and with the exception of the spouse, but if you inherited a non-retirement account, sorry, if you inherited an IRA account from a non-spouse beneficiary, you had the ability to essentially put that, uh, that account, continue that account using an inherited IRA, and that would have been considered a stretch IRA. It wasn't really a type of IRA, it was just a term that we utilized. But what that allowed the non-spousal beneficiary to do is continue all of the tax benefits on the corpus of the account, be it tax deferral or tax free, to be able to take the dollars, uh, to be able to let the dollars uh, compound over many, many years, with one exception, is that you had to take a distribution every year. And that was a good deal. And especially if the beneficiary was left to a child or a grandchild, because you would have decades to let the dollars continue to compound. It became this incredible legacy vehicle. But these accounts were never designed for legacy, not the IRS's intention. These accounts were designed for retirement. Of course, as financial practitioners, we exploited these rules because they were legal. And many of you, possibly many folks ended up having these retirement accounts that they can now stretch out for many years and it was great but remember the government is broke so these things weren't destined to last forever and they've caught up with us now so at this point they say look you cannot do this anymore you have to uh, uh, with a non-spousal beneficiary now make sure that those dollars are paid out within a 10-year period and the first version of this assumed that during that first 10 years, depending on the situation, but didn't require an RMD. Essentially, there was just one RMD, and that RMD was at the end of the 10th year after the, the IRA owner passed away. And that seemed to be pretty straightforward. 
Now, I will say that if you have inherited a retirement account from anybody, or maybe you haven't done the, the uh, administrative work on it yet, but if somebody's passed away prior to 2020, uh, there, this is something that you could still do. So a lot of times people say the stretch IRA is dead, and I think that's a misstatement. It's not dead, it's just dead as we knew it. It's changed because anybody at this time at least, and essentially this is an unwritten grandfathered rule by the way, but as of right now, anybody that passed away prior to 2020 can still continue the benefits of the old stretch out provision. So don't panic on the rest of the slides that we're gonna show if you still have that situation, you could still do it that way. But here are a few things to consider um, for inheriting beneficiary in terms of what to do, the logistical uh, structure in terms of what to do. First, you wanna change the social security number on the account uh, to, to your social security number uh, if you're the one inheriting. Then you're gonna change the title on the account and here's an example of what the title will look like. The key here is that the name of the decedent is on the account. You are not putting this into your own account that would be a huge mistake because on top of it um, causing a, a, a tax taxability of your own account, you also have a perpetual 6% penalty for the life of the account. Big mistake. So make sure that these all also are, are always titled and uh, appropriately and have the name of the decedent account owner on it, deceased account owner. Also, if possible, you always want to name a successor beneficiary um, if the custodian allows. If it's not, if it doesn't allow, make sure you maybe consider changing custodians because if something happens to you now, you don't want that money passing on to your estate that would go through probate. Instead, you want these dollars passing on now to your beneficiaries. And when changing plan providers, make sure that these funds are moved via direct transfer only. Earlier, um, Nancy spoke about rolling dollars over from a company plan to an IRA, and that's an option for yourself, but you cannot do that as a non-spouse beneficiary where you're taking possession of the money and then putting it into the inherited IRA. It has to be done directly, very, very uh, uh, akin to what uh, you have to do with the QCD, where the money has to go directly from one institution to the other. Uh, so no 60-day rollover. You always want to consult with your tax advisor on these things, but uh, you want to also make sure that they're privy and aware of these rules. Now, what I'm going to share with you uh, is maybe potentially controversial depending on what side of the camp you fall on, because there are new rules pertaining to the last set of rules that I shared with you, which was the required minimum distribution for somebody who's a non-spouse beneficiary and has 10 years to distribute the dollars. Because now, after they came out with that rule after the SECURE Act, they came back with another IRS, that is, they came back with another statement as an amendment, essentially, to those initial rules with clarification in 2022. And this is now proposed regulation. Proposed regulation is different than proposed legislation. Proposed regulation, it, it, piggybacking off of an existing law, is what their stated guidance is from the IRS. Now, some accountants aren't maybe utilizing this, so it's important to understand and recognize. In our practice, we're having this conversation with people's tax advisors, and we're taking generally the more conservative route because we don't want people to be hit with the 25 or 10 percent penalty. So basically, the new rule has this ALAR. It's the, if you think of it, just to keep it simple, is that least as rapidly rule. And that simply means if there were already required distributions that were turned on, that even if somebody is stuck with the 10 year payout as opposed to the stretch, the, the, the payout where you have to take the dollars over a 10 year period, that if RMDs were already paying out, then the beneficiary would also have to take required minimum distributions over that 10 year period and then empty the account out by the end of the 10th year. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the key difference there, and um, and and it's not it's not the same dollar amount that has to come out because the tables will be utilized depending on who the beneficiary might be. So it's important to understand it's really the concept of the frequency. Once it's turned on, can't be turned off. Not necessarily the exact amount. So don't get caught up in that. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, there are also these exceptions for these five eligible designated beneficiary groups. Now, I'm going to point out what I think is probably the most important handout that even most financial practitioners don't have, by the way, is this gold chart. This gold chart 
summarizes everything that uh, is on the last couple slides and will be on the next few slides. So don't worry if you get a little lost in this. I just want to at least make sure you know about it. And now you'll know where to go to reference this in the future. Um, but here in the goal chart and on the slide, what you see are these five exceptions. Now, these are exceptions because they're considered eligible. What are they eligible for? Well, they're eligible to do the stretch out like we were prior to somebody who passed away in 2019 or sooner. And so this is the continuation. These people can still do the stretch out provision and don't necessarily have to take the 10 year option, uh, the 10 year pay. Uh, it's because they're part of uh, oh these five plus the people who have passed away uh, and you've received inherited dollars from, uh, from an uh, old uh, uh, account that somebody passed away prior to 2020. Okay, now the spouse always has the best of the option choices. And the way that it works is the spouse, it's like they fly first class, they get the best choices of all. And so the spouse has the ability to do an inherited IRA, just like we showed you with the retitling, not putting it into their own name, but taking advantage of the retitling of the name. Um, it's not often given as an option, and I'm going to share with you a little bit more about that in a minute. Separately, they have the ability to take that inherited IRA later and just convert it into their own. They can treat it as their own. Uh, a non-spousal beneficiary cannot do this. And then finally, the spouse has the ability to roll over to their own. Remember, like that other slide said that a non-spousal beneficiary couldn't do that, but a spouse can. So best of all worlds, if, uh, you're, uh, if uh, a spouse receives the money, but unfortunately, too often, the spouse is not aware of these choices, especially if the financial CFO spouse is the one who passed away. And even then, unfortunately, when you go to get guidance, a lot of times the financial practitioners that don't understand these rules properly don't do this. And I'm going to give you an example. In this case, you've got the younger spouse inherits the IRA in 2020. And read the underlined word, needs cash need some cash for cash flow and expenses, maybe to cover some bills. Jim and Joan are married. Jim dies at age 75 after his re RBD, required beginning date, really big deal, and leaves his IRA to Joan at age 57. Joan chooses to do an inherited IRA instead of a spousal rollover. Why? Because they probably at least got good advice on what their choices were. But this is not the norm. This is the exception. Most of the time, advisors just recommend that they roll it over into their own name because A, they either um, don't know the rules properly or B, it's just simple. And, and that's not always going to be the best choice. So in this case, Joan will have to take the annual RMD still, remember, because it's an inherited IRA. So they're still, because the RBD has already started, Jim died at 75, so he was already receiving uh, RMDs. So Joan will have to continue the at least as rapidly rule, so continue to take the RMDs. But Joan will avoid the 10% early withdrawal penalty. Why? Because if Joan had taken this and rolled it over into her own name, she would have been under age 59 and a half and still subject to the early withdrawal too soon penalty. So this is a way where she would still have the ability to not worry about that penalty um, and still ultimately put the money back into her own name later and have all the benefits that a surviving spouse would have originally received. Make sense? Okay, here an older spouse inherits an IRA in 2020 and is tax sensitive, a little different. Tom and Tina are married. Tina dies at 64 before her RBD and leaves her IRA to Tom at age 74. Tom chooses to do an inherited IRA instead of a spousal rollover again, because he's been informed. And Tom will not have to take an annual RMD until Tina would have reached her beginning date. So again, he's leveraging Tina's age by utilizing the inherited IRA and not immediately putting it into his IRA because if he put it into his IRA, his RMDs would be subject to his age at 74, which would be considerably higher. Tom will still have access to funds without a 10% penalty and then at Tom's age, when Tina would have reached 72, that's when he could take this and convert it back into his own IRA. I will tell you that I sat with the client that I joined at a prominent attorney's firm local, and just, just a fly on the wall, I posed this as an idea, and I received some sort of ridicule as to why we couldn't do that in like a very unprofessional manner. I let it lie. 
we ended the session. The next day I shared with uh, our client the IRS rules pertaining to this. And I will tell you that he's been postponing these RMDs for seven years. An attorney specializes in estate planning, doesn't understand these rules. It happens. That's why I'm glad you're here. Okay, so in this case, determine if the deceased IRA owner was subject. Oh, so here's like best practices in terms of like, how do you go about this? Now, just the order of operation, so to speak. So the first thing is just determine if the IRA owner was subject to the RMDs. Now we know this is important because you have to see whether there was a required beginning date that was turned on. If so, be sure that that owner has taken the RMD during their lifetime, because if they didn't, that still needs to come out. And it has to come out. Originally, it was by December 31st of that year. They've now extended it so that you can have it by the tax filing deadline of the following year. So you want to make sure that that's come out. It will come out under your, whoever the beneficiary is, tax um, uh, 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 obligation, keep in mind, because the, you can't make the deceased person take a distribution. They can't sign for it anymore. So it'll be set up as the inherited IRA. Then you're, uh, as you're setting up, for the, you take the distribution as the beneficiary, excuse me. If there's multiple beneficiaries that exist, split the accounts by 1231 of the following year. This comes back to Nancy's point. Sometimes there are legitimate reasons to put dollars in the names of the trust, but they're not normally, they're not the norm for IRA accounts because the IRA accounts already are uh, will substitute. They're already probate avoiders. And if that's your entire reason for having a trust, it's really important for other assets, but not necessarily for your IRA accounts because it's just gonna complicate things. But if you do have different types of beneficiaries, now that you're understanding that there's different types, like a charitable organization, a trust, um, a, a spouse, a non-spouse, this is really important to consider splitting these up so that you could each take advantage of the appropriate uh, methodologies to distribute those. If it is a, a, a trust beneficiary, it should even be removed prior to this September of the following year. So now to start understanding the types of beneficiaries here, this again is the gold chart. You see the different acronyms, I'm gonna walk you through them. The first is a non-designated beneficiary. The non-designated beneficiary is essentially somebody who's not a living, breathing person. I'm gonna use an airline analogy here because how many of you have flown in an airline ever in the, in the baggage area? Anybody? You're not gonna do it, right? It's a non-living, breathing person. That's where the baggage goes. And that is essentially going to be, you can't live there. So just remember that. This is gonna be a, a trust, a, a charitable organization, or if somebody doesn't name their beneficiary at all, it defaults to the estate and, and that goes through probate. So basically if somebody uh, has those beneficiary situations and they're receiving the dollars before the RBD has started, it's not a 10 year rule, it's a five year rule. No RMDs over that five year period, but has to be cashed out prior to five years. If the RBD had already started for the owner, this is a really weird one. This, they use this ghost rule uh, scenario. And this is where the stretch payments are made um, based upon the deceased owner as if though they had lived. <laughs> really strange. Uh, the point here is it doesn't have to be emptied within five years, but the R required distributions do begin starting year one. So it's important to make sure you're making distributions and hopefully you're never going to have that situation because you're going to have good financial advice and estate planning and not be in that situation. More common, however, is somebody that's inheriting dollars that is a non-eligible designated beneficiary. This is anybody who's not the spouse and, uh, uh, and anybody who's not one of those other five criteria, which again is uh, highlighted there on the, on the Non-eligible designated beneficiary. I thought I had added that. Maybe this is an old version, but it is on your gold chart. Okay, so you'll see the five criteria on the gold chart of who these people are. And again, if there's no, um, uh, if there's the account owner dies before the required beginning date, this is where they're now going to be subject to the 10-year rule. No required distributions at this point. But if the RBD had already been in effect, the required distributions had started, now the annual distributions are required in years one through nine of that 10-year period. That's the difference between the first version of the SECURE Act rule and the, now the newest version. So be careful not to get caught up in that. And you can go to the IRS website and look at it. It actually lists this information right there. 
Finally, you've got the eligible designated beneficiaries and, oh, here's what I was referring to. The eligible designated beneficiaries, this is where your five uh, uh, ca categories of people are going to live. Now, I will mention on the five categories um, as we're looking through them, because I forget if there's a separate slide on it or not, but it's important to understand a couple of items. The first is, uh, let's say it says a minor child. You've got the minor child, and as you're going through that, you want to make certain that that minor child uh, can stretch out the IRAs, but only to age 21. So if they inherited at age 10, they can stretch for 11 years, and then they're subject to the 10-year rule. Okay, so keep that in mind. Also, if somebody is uh, inherits the dollars and they're, oh, I guess I'll get to that example in just a quick moment. So let me keep going through here. I think we're getting close on time, right? Five minutes? Okay. So I'm going to speed up. apologize. I want to get to the important parts to make sure you don't miss anything. But here it is. You've got the stretch RMDs, um, and they have the choice. That's very unique because they're an eligible designated beneficiary. So they have the choice of making the RBD, uh, of, excuse me, of taking the stretch IRA option or um, selecting the 10-year rule. And that's going to depend on what tax situation they're in. If they select the 10-year rule, there's no RMDs, which might help if somebody's still working. But on the other hand, um, the stretch IRA would last over a longer period of time. And then if the RMDs have already been turned on uh, for the deceased spouse, this is where that essentially has to continue. You do not have the tenure option here. And I've highlighted something that often gets missed even by financial practitioners is that you can select the age of the more favorable person, the person who passed away or, um, or the, the, the beneficiary. So uh, step three is depending on the beneficiary type, now that you know the different types is determine if and when the RMDs is necessary. Be certain to use the proper table, which you've already spoken about and initiate the RMDs with the IRA custodians. Um, you will have this in your handouts. I just want to mention that, and I've mentioned before, that a beneficiary, as a, a non-spouse beneficiary, as opposed to the spousal beneficiary, or anybody that's selecting um, the inherited IRA path, is going to use this table that's on the back of your uniform distribution table. Uniform distribution table is essentially two lives. This is a single life table, so the divisors will be different. Give you some perspective, if somebody is age 73, um, they have to take out about 4% during their lifetime with a uniform table, but with this table, it's closer to about six, a little over six, six and a half percent. So it makes you take more money out, but you could typically leave the money in there for a lot longer period of time. Also, how the calculation is done. When you're living, you're going to your required, uh, re you're going to your table, and you're looking at that every year and using that different divisor. Not so on this. This is really important to catch, so I want to make sure I hit it, is that if somebody has passed away here, non-spousal beneficiary, let's say passed away at age 50, um, then you're going to go back to that. That's going to be your starting divisor. And then the next year, you're just going to go from 36.2 and subtract 1. So the divisor for next year is 35.1. The year after that, it's 34.1, 33.1 after that. In other words, you don't keep going back to the table. The only one that can do that is the spouse. Okay, and uh, the other table was same concept, but for Roth IRAs. Um, the example here was where Pam and Paula are sisters. Pam dies at age 55 and leaves her IRA to Paula at age 50. Is Paula limited to the 10-year rule? Yes or no? And the answer is no. And the reason why is because even though Pam uh, was, was because Pam was older, and by default, and this will be on your goal chart as, year, uh, as well, even though the rule says um, for somebody that's not more than 10 years younger, that by default also means anybody that's 10 years older. This happened recently. One of our clients passed away the same ages. I use the same ages. Was told by a very prominent financial firm she could not do the stretch IRA. She's stretching that IRA now for the rest of her life. So. Uh, keep in mind that, that there's some other items there. Uh, in terms of the last item here, your successor beneficiary, generally subject to the 10 year rule. So this is the beneficiary's beneficiary. Is now, they, they cannot stretch it forever. They're subject to the 10 year rule. And if there was already a 10 year period started, let's say there were six years into that 10 year rule, they cannot start another 10 years. They only have four years left within that uh, total 10 year period. So basically you get one 10 year period. And you have these on the tail end, just some action items for you to uh, consider, really items to discuss uh, with your advisors are here for you to, to consider 
The most important element here is just to understand this whole concept of IRA accounts now as legacy vehicles has essentially been downgraded. The Congress has essentially changed the rules. It may be important to consider you changing your plans as a result of this and seeing it works best so you can be an even better steward for yourself and your family. Thank you, everybody. I thought you were going to answer them. I didn't frame my class. Okay. Okay. Uh, donor advice fund. So I will be 73 this year. I am considering setting up a donor advice fund to help distribute uh, to charity. Please comment. Okay. This. You want to comment? Take no, Okay, this is just uh, in consideration of a donor advised fund. It's something that uh, Nancy had on her bullet of items of different ways to contribute possibly to Torrance Memorial, uh, but obviously you can make the selection of where you do that with. And the question is, I'll be 73 this year. Um, I'm considering setting up a donor advised fund to help distribute uh, to charity. Uh, please comment. Uh, yeah, this is great. A donor advised fund, so you guys know what that is, is just another way to get uh, dollars into a qualified charitable organizations or a group of organizations without having to contribute individually to different organizations. You can essentially set up a donor advice fund, which uh, essentially will put the monies into your own little foundation account, and you get the entire the entire deduction as of the year that you make the contribution, but then you do not have to actually contribute the money to the charitable organizations for many years. So if you make a contribution, let's just say for $10,000 this year, uh, you will get the deduction for $10,000 this year, but maybe you leave it in there for 10 years and that 10,000 grows to 20,000 or 25 or 30,000. Now you've got even more money to give to the charitable organization. You cannot do a distribution from your IRAs for it to offset against your RMDs, which is the topic for today, and go into a donor advised fund, but it's a great tool to utilize for other assets, especially if you're below, uh, if you're trying to uh, maximize your tax efficiency for the, the year. The IRS likes to see 5% come out of those gaps every year. Oh, good point. If you guys didn't hear that, the IRS likes to see at least 5% coming out of those donor advised funds every single year. Um, Okay, I have one here. 86 year old has $500,000 of an investment account, a million dollars in an IRA, not a Roth, $30,000 of caregiver costs. Question is, should they draw down the IRA or the regular investment first? Well, that's a big question, pretty generalized. Typically on something like that, we look to see, do you have children you want to pass on to? You know, what's the situation in your life and what are your goals for the future? You'd probably want to look at that as making a con taking a combination of both sides, but it, that's a pretty big question to be give you a generalized answer. You probably want to look to see what you had at that point. Uh, sure, I've got a few here. Um, what is a good example when a Roth conversion is advantageous? We had the slide, um, a number of factors to take into consideration, um, but really uh, it, it just has to do with what your objective is. One of the objectives is either going to be to you, so you have money without having to worry about the tax implication in the future during your lifetime. Uh, sometimes people worry too much about a break even point, but that uh, in terms of when you uh, break even on having paid the taxes, uh, but that maybe also comes to the other objective. If it's not for you, if it's for your grandkids, uh, we did this one time when somebody was in their 80s. I remember they had a Amgen stock uh, uh, years ago, and even though they did it for the grandkids, that, that uh, almost doubled within a couple of years, and they were still able to utilize some of those dollars for themselves. So really it's just uh, who, how and who you want to uh, benefit those dollars. There are other reasons more strategic that I just don't have time to get into, but over the next few years, if you have other purchases that are not traditional reasons to do it, 
but because of the tax law changes, there might be other reasons to do that as well. If you're wanting to buy a car or fund a down payment on a home in the next few years. Uh, question here is how many direct rollovers does the IRS allow in a year uh, from a 401k plan to a traditional IRA plan? Uh, I'm assuming this question means you're still working. That actually has to do with the plan, 401k plan itself. Um, sometimes the plan will, even if you're still working, will allow you to roll out of the plan into your own IRA at 59 and a half. Others won't allow you to. So it really depends on the 401k plan itself and their rules. Yeah, and, and I'll just add to that because you can do an unlimited amount of trustee to trustee transfers. So if you're, if you're rolling dollars from one institution to another, you could do that unlimited times. Uh, you, yeah, you could even do a rollover from an institution to an IRA unlimited times, but you cannot do a rollover from an IRA where you're taking possession of the money and put it into another IRA um, more than once, uh, once every 365 days. This was something that was common, and I'm going to bring it up because uh, probably your parents maybe used to take dollars from one bank account to another when the CD rates changed a quarter of a percent just to get the higher rate of return. They would take the check, walk it over to the bank next door and do that. Now that rates are higher, you have to be very careful not to take possession of that money more than once every, just don't even do it. Just do it, uh, transfer directly from one institution to the other. I'll get, I'll, I'll clean, I'll see <laughs> if I can. And glasses are sort of new for me too, and these are, can you start, uh, can you start a Roth IRA with money you've withdrawn as RMDs? No, I'm glad you brought this up because this is a really important point and I failed to mention it and um, I apologize for that, but uh, it is, you are not able to do a Roth conversion with the money, with the, with the required minimum distribution amount. This is the number one reason why when people uh, were sitting across from folks, and we're telling them this at age 73, as they're turning age 73, they say, I wish I would have met you sooner. I wish I would have known this sooner. Um, and if you want to do a conversion after 73, you could still do it, but now you have to pay tax on the uh, RMD and tax on the dollars that you're doing the conversion with, which means you have to become even more savvy in the tactical strategies you utilize to help offset against those taxes but also why I said 59 and a half to 73 is a wonderful window of planning opportunity. So Miss Jokester Sandy gave me a note card with great big printing so I can read it. <laughs> Basically, the question is asking Mitchell if there's any questions from Zoom participants. There are no questions from Zoom. Okay. Uh, I had one back here. Let's see, what did I do with it? It was, uh, I'm sorry, I lost track of it. Oh, um, this is really, the, what kind of rollover options are there for 401ks? I think we answered that. Basically, if you're still working, it depends on the plan design. Um, but otherwise, you can, uh, we had a slide that said that you can, leave the plan, uh, the 401k, money in the 401k, you can take it with you to your new employer, roll it into the new 401k plan, you can roll it into your own personal IRA, you can take lump, lump sum distributions, of course it's all taxed, but those are basically your options there. I've got an easy one and a little bit more uh, intricate, but the RMDs, uh, can they be aggregated between traditional IRAs and rollover IRAs? We had it on the chart of all the different versions that you could do that on your handout. Um, this was a just distinction on dollars that have been rolled over from a 401k plan versus a traditional IRA that were contributed. Yeah, th those are still an IRA account. Those can be aggregated, no problem. Um, in terms of the second one, please describe how high RMDs can impact income uh, tax rates imposed via IRMA and the uh, NIIT. Uh, which is net, in, which is the net investment income tax from Obamacare, essentially. Um, but yeah, these are very, very good points because uh, and I mentioned these in the terms of the term I used is tsunami RMDs. These are the additional dollars that you are 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 causing you additional tax, uh, sometimes dollars that you don't need. 
but uh, in terms of your Medicare Part B uh, thresholds, these any distributions, regardless of whether they're required or not, uh, could put you even one dollar at the threshold and causes you now to pay additional tax. Uh, so a lot of times people don't want to do a conversion from that. And the number one, you may have heard this as well, I, I imagine, but I think all advisors, the number one complaint that we hear from people that did a conversion come to, came back later to find out if they didn't know in advance, which you should know in advance, is that um, they, they were bumped up over this Irma threshold. And it comes back as a surprise because you didn't know it. Um, and it's a bummer if you didn't know it, but the good news, however, is you've ever looked at the projection uh, of how much you're doing, and this is where it has to be done strategically, it could potentially lower your Irma threshold for many years thereafter. So understand the bigger picture. Don't get caught up again in how much tax or Irma you're paying this year. Look at the big picture over the lifetime tax bill. Same card, please comment on the benefits and, and, and the net investment income tax, by the way, similar concept, but that's if you're single and making more than $200,000 a year or joint and making more than $250,000 a year. You wanna be aware of these thresholds, which is why it's important to utilize a financial analysis tool, tax analysis tool, but also not just to do scorekeeping from last year, like we're all doing right now. You can't win the game after the game is already over. So it's very important June of this year to dust off the return that you're gonna get this year and start thinking of how to do proactive tax planning for this year and those ahead. Um, go ahead and I'll yeah. cover that second. Uh, Roth IRA, can you explain how they work? So, uh, uh, and then the next question is, if not, can, you, can I roll over all of my regular IRA to my Roth IRA? Roth IRA basically is you're putting money into it that's already been taxed. So it's similar to your investment account. The difference is it's all tax deferred. And so it ha it's what we've been talking about up here the whole time. So especially for younger people, consider that a snowball rolling down a hill. As it goes down the hill, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. By the time you retire, you have this big pot of money that's already been taxed and then it's added to some of your other taxable income and you have a much bigger paycheck that you get to spend instead of having to pay part of it remember that cash flow chart so that tax column is significantly less and yes you can roll over the um, ira into a roth but we're very strategic about that so we look at uh, lots of different options, and maybe you want to do part now and part later. So you don't have to do it all at once, nor maybe should you. You have to look at all that. Two more questions. Let's do two more. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is a good one uh, as well, and also just in the interest of time, it's hard to put all the slides in there. It, it, simplicity is the is the challenge, right? And uh, just narrowing it down to the slides you had is very difficult. But please comment on the benefits of paying Roth conversion income from after-tax savings from uh, going to the Roth IRA account. So this is, first of all, you, you, you oh, okay, there's two aspects here. I'm, I, I misread it, but I wanna cover them both now. Um, first of all, a lot of times people, um, it, it works well if you're doing a conversion, ideally to pay the tax from a non uh, a non IRA source that way you get more money into the Roth conversion, but there's a new paradigm shift in terms of thinking here that it's actually still okay to do and pay the tax from some of your IRA accounts if that's your only place to do it from, uh, but at the same time uh, it, there could be other strategic ways where you're where you're uh, even potentially borrowing money to pay some of the tax which could be better than paying years and years of tax forever. So just mention that. The other has to do with utilizing after tax monies. Um, like if you're, if you're gonna convert dollars uh, or take distributions from an IRA account that have after tax dollars, which we didn't mention uh, in there, and you might have that. I sat uh, across the table from somebody one time and I asked if they had any after tax dollars uh, uh, from uh, uh, Northrop and they, had, they, didn't, they didn't think they had any. When we looked, they had $200,000 of dollars in their 401k that they had already paid tax on. But you cannot just, uh, when you're taking those dollars out, there's a pro rata rule. Um, and once those dollars are commingled like that, it's like coffee and cream. Once you mix them together, you can't unmix them. So as they come out, they come out with a pro rata formula. With one exception, however, and I don't know if you knew this, is the, the after-tax dollars can come out skimming off the top for a qualified charitable distribution. So if you have after-tax dollars, you could skim off the top and give it to Torrance Memorial. Yeah. 
One more. Uh, anything more to know for a 72-year-old widow with no children, uh, charities as beneficiaries? Well, um, that's probably where you'd want to sit down. I think what you're asking is, uh, can you give more to charities, I think is what you're asking. Yes, and, and you can do it in those strategic ways. Just don't make the mistake of having it go in your checking account first. You want to make sure you're doing it correctly so you get the, the correct tax benefit for you. I was just going to mention there's a few more unanswered questions. We'll answer these and maybe you could send them to everybody. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Send an email. In fact, why don't you give me all the cards Here's the and I'll put unanswered. them. Yeah, the unanswered ones mm -hmm. and Here's I the answer. will send them to you for emails. That's yeah. great. All right, let's give them a huge round of applause. It's a lot of great information. And sorry if we didn't get to all your questions, but as Chris just said, I will uh, gather the questions together and send it to them. And if there's one really you want specifically answered for you, send it to me in an email, and then I'll get that specific question for you too. So um, again, a lot of great information today. There are a couple things I wanted to mention. Uh, the, when, with, when we're talking about the QCDs, it's really important that you don't wait too long in the year to send them out because we receive the checks from your IRA administrator and it's not it and if we receive it if you have it cut in December and we receive that check in January it doesn't count to your RMD for the December for that previous year because it do, it it only counts to your I, I, to your RMD when it's taken from your account okay when you make a regular charitable donation, as long as you get it postmarked by 1231 of that year, it counts for that year, but that's not true for a QCD. So be sure you make those early on, you know, you can't, the post office is um, sometimes inconsistent with how they deliver mail. So um, it, it is important to do that, you know, early, like in November at the latest. We do have a lot of donors who use the QCD to make their donations, and it's, it's really a great way to support charity and avoid the taxes for you. Um, Chris had a bunch of handouts that um, not th those on Zoom, and maybe some of you didn't get because we didn't have enough, so he did give me the PDF for that. When I send out the email letting you all know where the webinar is posted, um, the attachments will be with that email. So you'll be able to get the PowerPoint attachment and those handouts. It'll also be posted on that website where we post the recording. So there are, walking, there are a few walk-ins that didn't write the email address down if they want it to get access yeah, it. Yeah, and that's a great way to, uh, on the evaluation form too, to be sure to make a note on there for um, any of these specific things that you want, and I'll be sure you get them. I do pay attention to those evaluations, so please do take a few minutes to, uh, to complete that and give us some feedback. If there's a topic you'd really like to hear about, write it down, and uh, you know there are some suggestions on there for you to circle, but also write it down so that, that we will know. Um, talked about that. Our next seminar is on May 11 about savvy social security planning and you have the handout with that. That's with certified financial planners Kristen Rigg and Gregory Schill will be presenting that. And then in July we're going to do the boot camp for the executor. And uh, when you see that title it kind of looks like executor but it's actually executor <laughs> and it has to do with estate planning and Suzanne will be presenting that with uh, attorney Stephanie Besner. So that will be another great one. So now we've reached the time for our door prize tickets. Is there any, please raise your hand if you did not get a little red ticket when you came in and Suzanne will bring one by. Anybody not get it? Okay, I'm gonna have Nancy and Chris help me draw some um, tickets. Chris bought, brought three books, The Bucket Plan. And so we have three of those to give away along with some gift cards. We'll start with these four. So here the, for the book, let's do the books first. They're the bucket plan. And the first winner is 
108, you're all, you're all, they all should start with that. 360, 360, anybody out there with that one? No? Okay, how about the last three numbers are 384? All right, Ruth's got that one. Okay, Betty, you want to do the next one? This is, again, the bucket plan. How about the last three digits, 373? 373? No, okay, how about 382? Over there, okay. And I need some more tickets. Okay. I don't think we need that on there. There's another book. So the last book is going to go to number 398. The last three digits are 398. Wow, where are all these tickets? No 398. How about 388? There's Donna. Okay. Now, it's Oscar weekend. So tomorrow night is the Oscars. So we're going to give away a couple uh, movie theater um, gift cards. So here's one for $15 to Regal, 391. 391, right here. And Regal is up on the hill, so that works out good. And here's an AMC for $15. How about 391? Oh, I'm sorry, I just read that. Sorry, I forgot to pick up the next ticket. 395. Yay! All right, two more. Okay, and now for the coffee drinkers out there, how about Starbucks for ten dollars on four one one? Four one one. Anybody out there with four one one? Hmm. Okay. How about four one three? Four one three. Where is everybody? How about 348? 348, way in the back. Okay, and then one more. We're going to do Panera Bread for $10. And I'll just pick that out. Last three digits, 357. 357? Okay, very good. All right. Thank you all for coming today. Don't forget to change your clocks tonight. And uh, yeah, and the, the newsletter. You had a, uh, there I put some on the back okay. table. Let, let me share one, just one last thing real quickly. It's, um, I, I had a, I submitted an article on a odd rule. This won't work for everybody, but uh, it got published in a national newsletter. I just happened to receive the printed copies, but I don't have enough for everybody. Uh, so we'll get these out PDF. But this is for anybody that is over age 70 and a half and still working. So um, it, it's just the odd new uh, rules pertaining to the IRA. So if anybody wants a copy of those, we have them here. If not, we'll just send them with, uh, with the everybody. Back table. Oh, the back? In the back table. And I'll actually, I'll, I'll create a PDF of that article and send it to everybody too. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in the back, yeah. You can turn in your evaluation forms as you leave or put them on the table in the back. Thank you again for coming. Have a great weekend.